Can I thank you? It's a question, eh? Can I thank you? Yes. Because we live in a society that already entered in the church, this artifact that we need to say thank you for everything. And if we don't get a thank you, it's uh, an offense. We need the thank you, which is a word, which is a sentence that uh, uh, transmits a good education, politeness. It is also a way of getting a, a source or a sense of recognition to be recognized. And we live in a society that each and every day we want to be more and more recognized. And what it shows the most about that is Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all these media platforms that we all are aware of. Some we use them, some we don't, but we can see that in many people it's to show and to transmit something that eventually we don't even leave what we show. You can take a picture behind the palace and doesn't mean that you live in the palace or that you went or that you enter in the palace. You can take a picture next to this uh, how do you, how do you call it? rifle range, this where you have the the how do you call that? No, this thing that you have a carousel and so on. Yeah. You can go there and you take a picture in the door and does it mean that you were in there? It means that you just passed by and you took a picture. Mm -hmm. But in social media we can show many things that they are not, they don't show what, what it really happens with our lives. We can post stuff that can sound very intelligent, very smart, very spiritual, yet we don't leave that level of spirituality, smartness and so on. So we are living days where where us as servants of God have the need of having value and always somebody to approve us. The clap in the back, you did very well, I'm so happy for you. Oh, you are the best person. Oh, nobody can replace you. Yesterday I shared with somebody in the office that occurred to me that many people sometimes they leave the ministry because it's, it, they live in a, in a sort of revenge, like if if I leave, nobody can do the work I do. Nobody can do what I'm doing, so I'm going to leave. It. And then they end up by, by stumble in their own miseries, in their own stories, without understanding that in the end of the day, you didn't revenge nobody, you didn't revenge me, you didn't revenge the ministry, because the work will be keep going and keep doing it. If not by you, by somebody else. It's not, if not by me, by somebody else. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, says... Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. It's three, three spiritual principles that speaks here, that the Apostle Paul addresses Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. First and foremost is do your best to be to, to present yourself to God as one approved. He didn't say that to, be, to present yourself before me or before somebody else or before your congregation. And it exists this also in the congregations. The pastor has to be approved by the congregation. The pastor has to have a certain behavior and a certain status quo or whatever in order to be approved. In many churches, the pastor, yes, he does have to drive a good car because he preaches about prosperity. I met people like this because he preaches about prosperity. So he must have, by, uh, by definition, he must drive a good car, the best car that can be in the market because he preaches prosperity. He's a servant of God. And if that doesn't happen, so it means that something is wrong because he's not driving that good car. Something is wrong. Maybe he lives a sinful life because he's not driving a good car, for instance. So he says, try to, do, to, to present yourself as one approved before God, not before any other man, not before himself. And the congregation does not, I don't, I don't need to be approved by you. I need to be approved by God. You don't need to be approved by me. You need to be approved by God. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, no need to be ashamed of whatever it needs to be done. 
right? Handling the word of truth. In other words, a well-known person of the word of truth of the Bible. I wrote, he does not, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't, uh, he's not approved by me, yet before God. In other words, we must seek God's approval and not from any man. But the tendency is always there. What tendency? The tendency of getting others' attention, the tendency of getting others' approval and valuation. Today we'll see that we have no value at all whatsoever unless the one placed by God as his children and servants. Value also as individuals. And we are, in the end of the day, his individuals and his masterpiece. Luke chapter 17, verse 7. And we'll be in Luke 17, so you can leave the Bible open there. Then when I get to my conclusion... I will start jumping to another verses, but now we're going to stay in Luke 17, verse 7, that says, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him, when he has come in from the field, field come at once and recline at the table? It's a question that Jesus does. Jesus himself, he does this question. Again, Will any of you who has servants plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table? Of course, the answer is no, especially according with those days. The answer is it will be no. So I wrote as my point one, unstoppable servants. In other words, the man or the woman that say, I am a servant of God. It must be a person that does not stop, is unstoppable. It's a person also that even if you have moments that you are tired, those will be just moments. It cannot be continuously in your life that you are always in that will of I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. If that happens, something is wrong. Very wrong. But the moment, it's there for us to enjoy it. I'm tired, today I don't feel okay, and so on and so on. We, have all, we all have those moments. So unstoppable servants, it's saying that we need to be capable to be always, always ready for everything. We don't stop. Those that say already that they want to serve God, we must have this mindset. I, I'm not here to stop. There is always something to do. There is always somewhere to go. There is always someone to attend. I don't like when the people tell me, I know I didn't want to speak with you yesterday because I think you were, your work was already, you were overwhelmed already. And uh, because I'm, I, I, if somebody approached me and said, I want to speak with you, so you must speak now. We don't, even if I have to go to bed later, if I have to, to arrive home later, I, I do it now. Because of what? Because of what is written here. I need to be an unstoppable servant. Luke 17 verse 8 says, Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Another question Jesus does. And I wrote servants of obligations as my point two, servants obligations. In other words, we all as servants of God, we do have obligations. But the problem also states that many, we say that we are servants, but we are not. Many, we say that we serve God, but we are not serving God. Many, we say that we are here because we are here for God and we do the things for God, but we have our secret agenda that does not belong to the plan of God. But it's very easy for us to disguise as men of God, as women of God, and pretend to be what we are not. And at the minute that somebody asks you to do something that is over your schedule, over your agenda, over and over and over, simply we are no longer ready to fulfill nothing. But we do have obligations as servants. 
Jesus, you will see in the end that Jesus is really comparing this servant that comes from plowing in the field, that does not sit with the master. No, he still has stuff to do. He must be unstoppable and he does have other obligations after coming from the field, after coming from work. If you understand what I'm saying, he still has obligations to fulfill and he's comparing this servant with you and I. You will see ahead. In what? In my point three, which is I do what have to be done. I do what have to be done. Luke 17, 9 and 10. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? And let's stop here. Does Jesus, does the man thanks? A servant is a servant. Of course, now in our days, we see that these things, they take place. And I'm not saying or preaching that from now on, you shouldn't thank people. I thank people all the time, of course. Somebody is serving you, attend you, say thank you. But for, in the reality that Jesus was living in those days, wasn't no need of thankfulness. But then because the Bible is eternal, and the Bible is always up to date. It doesn't, you don't need an application in your phone to, to, up, to update the, the Bible in order to, be, to, to, to fit in the context of your days. But the Bible, in other words, written as was written, it will always fit in the context of your days. It's not that we have to try to fit our days in, 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 and with the context of that our days to, to that we can serve ourselves and read the Bible, interpret the way we want. It is written and it is, it is written. So this is the, the, the way Jesus showed us how a servant must behave. You don't need to update this and say, you know what? This was in the context of those days. So I think we need to up to date this here and there. We don't need. This is what is at stake. Does the, he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? We know the answer is no. He doesn't thank. Why? Because he did what he had to do. But in the church, this must be put in place. And many times it's put in place. But in the end of the day, it becomes a rock of offense for many because I should receive a, 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 a sense of a, a, sort, a, a sort of honor, a sort, of, a sort of, of thankfulness and gratitude, and I'm not receiving that. I wonder if the people are seeing what I've been doing. Can they see the way I'm doing it? So the question remains, so who you are doing for? For yourself and your recognition or you are doing for God? Because when we do for God, we don't need any kind of recognition because we are aware that he is everywhere and he can see what we are doing. But then in order for him to reward you, you in order for him to reward you in public, you, you need in secret to do the things not looking for nobody to, for the recognition of nobody. That's why many are not honored by God, because you seek the recognition and the honor of men. You seek the reward and the clap in the back of men. So then, if, you, if, if, if God says, if you are content with the recognition of your authority or, your, or a brother or sister, so I think you don't need my recognition. But in, in the end of the day, the recognition or the reward of God, it will come in a shape that you are not expecting. And that is another problem we live is that we have a, a, a shape of, of blessing or a shape of recognition that we want to receive that does not correspond to what God has for us. The acceptance, uh, acceptance of God, it, it has to come with the acceptance of everything that God has for us. And we, are, we need to be able, with your spiritual eyes, to recognize what God has for you. What, he, what, are, what have been him giving to you? What is giving to you? And when he gives, he gives. He doesn't take it back. But sometimes also he, also, he, he does and gives stuff to us that we don't even recognize that is God's doing. Because we are looking to another level of recognition. And then we, don't, we, we are not able to acknowledge God. Continuing the verse 10, it says, So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. These are the words of Jesus himself. I, I am unworthy. There is nothing 
good within me. But I must receive that, that thankfulness, that recognition, that in order for me to feel okay. That came out of my mouth many times. Don't think that I'm preaching something that uh, I'm the best, I'm very good. That came out of my, of my mouth many times. Oh, nobody recognized my work. Oh, nobody see what I've been doing. Oh, this and that. But also come out of my mind, or the work in my mind, also come to destroy those arguments, to destroy those uh, sophismas, which is, in the end of the day, fake arguments to justify something that it is not biblical. Looking for a recognition that is not biblical, that will, will, will make me boast instead of making me, keeping me in that level of humbleness. You know, if somebody paints this wall and I come here and I say this is very well, I'm telling you now that all the other walls, they won't have the same details as that one. Because that, the, it comes, it, it, it comes to us the high concept of I do it very well. And then we don't put that level of excellence because of it. So sometimes the, the lack of thankfulness that some, or recognition that somebody can have towards you, it can result that it improves you more than the improvement you expect from people clapping in your back saying that you are very good. Because it keeps you low, low level. And, and doing the stuff with another perspective, pushing yourself to your limit and to a level of excellence that will be recognized by God. But for that, you need to understand that God does recognize what you do. He does. And He does reward you. But can you see the reward? But if you have your little book, pocket book, that the reward has to be like this, like that, with this shape, with this pattern, this color, this is this how, how it must be my reward. Then you have a problem because God will already reward you and you can't see the reward. We had a servant of God that is, is serving in Remar Belize, used to be frustrated sometimes speaking with me because he, he wants you want to be a father, a father, children, 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 a father. And I told him, my brother, you already are, a, you are, you are already a father. Can't you see? God gave you already children. You are already a father. You are a better father than many fathers. But you need to see what God is giving to you. You need to be aware of God is of what God is giving to you. So I did what it have to be done. Conclusion, we are unworthy servants. And I, in bold letters I wrote, this was told by Jesus, not by me. Unworthy servants. So every time you think that, or, or I, or we think that we are so good and serving God, and we come to church and this and that, we must come down and say, you know what, I am unworthy. I am unworthy. We continually are expecting levels of recognition, value, and appreciation. People to tell us how good we are. But does this correspond to the truth? And in bold letters I wrote, are we that good? Mark chapter 10 verse 18 says, And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus is speaking to the rich young man. Okay? That used to fulfill everything. Used to... You, you used to fulfill the law in every single manner. But was something that was missing this man was to give the most valuable thing that he had. That was, he was rich. Sell your stuff, give your stuff, abandon your stuff, and give to the poorest of the poorest. Give to them, to the one that lives in need. That man went away from, Jesus, from the presence of Jesus, said, with it, the, his, his, his face changed, his perspective changed. Because in the minute that we think that we are fulfilling everything, there is always something within us that we are not capable to give, to let it go. So Jesus is showing that it's easy for you to live according with the laws, and that's why I believe that Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to break, to fulfill the law. But of course, by fulfilling them, he became the law himself. And then he changed the law to two commandments. Love God above all things and 
love your, love your neighbor as yourself. Two commandments, simple. But for, first and foremost, he did what? He fulfilled the law. But he knew that it's easy for the mankind to fulfill the law. Well, we, we live in the New, Testament, the New Testamentary era right now. So we, we, don't, we, we don't clearly look to the Ten Commandments. We attend them because even the Ten Commandments, commandments they are part of the, of the patterns of society. Lawfully speaking, of course, you know that you shouldn't kill, you know that we shouldn't lie, we know that you shouldn't steal, and so on. And there are ten, and they are very, very simple, but they, they, are, they, are, they are there in the society, they are part of the laws, even for the unbelievers, it's part of the law. So they, they, but, but I think that even as in our days that we don't observe them that much, we come to the church and we do have laws in the church that for us it's simple to fulfill them and to say, you know what, I am fulfilling the law, I am fulfilling the plan. So that's why Jesus comes and says, no, you know what, it's not about that because you, you are rich, you have, you have money, you have power, you have everything, you go to the, to the synagogue, you give money to the poorest, you give your tithing, you, you observe the law and this and that, according with these young men, that could be you and I, but then he says, you know what, but if you want to fulfill the plan, so sell everything you have and give to the poorest and follow me. That is the key for a Christian. It's the follow me. That is the, the, the first commandments of Jesus was, follow me. Looking to his disciples, still doing stuff, uh, working and doing, working and fishing and what, what, what. And the, 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 the commandments was, follow me. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good expect, except God alone. So this man knew the law. That's why Jesus answered, answered him like this. You know that for a, for a rabbi, for a master of the law, he knew in first place that this is, this is what they learn in the synagogues, that no one is, is good unless God. And this is it. There is no goodness in us unless the one we place and establish as society. We establish that level of goodness and madness. We are the ones that establish, establish lev levels of goodness, madness, evilness. We are the ones that say, this is good and this is bad. Can we compare the perception of goodness of God with ours? What is good for you and what is good for God? What was good for this young man? Good for this young man, that's why he approached Jesus. I think he was a bit uh, boasting himself. What was good for him is that, you know what, I go to the synagogue and I fulfill everything that I have to be fulfilled. But there is one question that I have. What shall I do to gain eternal life? What, what can I do to be saved? The question that echoes in many Christians, in many men. But then when, 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 when the price to pay comes, we are not able and willing to pay. We want salvation, but we want salvation for granted. Thinking that is the, the fact that I come to church, I am saved. And it is not right according with the truth. You can be saved uh, uh, and not being in the church. And maybe you come to church every Sunday and you are not saved. I know people that clearly they are not saved. And they serve in this ministry. And they are here for a long time than I am in the ministry of Rimar, in Body of Messiah Christian Church. And they are not saved. And it's visible. There is no salvation. Can you judge that, Pastor? There is ways of judging. It's not that then we're going to make a, a full judgment, but there is ways because Jesus says and established the, the, the rule, the ruler, which is by the fruits you will know them. The fruit is the revelation of oneself before God. But can we compare the per per perception of goodness of God with ours? In the end of the day, it is all about Jesus, we say, and we sing, it's all about Jesus. At least I wrote, at least is what we say, that is all about Him. In John chapter 3, verse 30, John the Baptist says, He must increase, but I must decrease. John the Baptist was the man that was preparing the way for the coming of Jesus. 
Are you and I preparing the way? Because we must prepare the way. He was the one that was preparing the way for the coming of Jesus. The one that he wasn't worthy of, of untie the, the shoes. I don't know the word in English for that, those type of shoes. He was the one that wasn't worthy to untie his shoes. He was waiting for him. There is, he used to say, there is one that is bigger than I. There is one that is capable of doing much things. I am just preparing the way. I am a servant. This was his speech. I am a servant. I am preparing the way for a bigger one. For a higher one. For somebody with more power. With more authority. So he says, I must increase, he must increase, but I must decrease. In other words, he must be higher than me. Even if he doesn't want that, he will always be higher than me. Like we sing yesterday, you lift me up, you, you lay yourself down. Huh? You remember, Rita's been singing that song, you lay yourself down and you lift us up. I have to decrease. I cannot have a higher concept of myself, myself as a servant of God, according with the function that I have in the body of Christ. And this is a road speaking about myself. According with the function that I have in the body of Christ, I am done. I, João Luis, I am done. With, with, the, with the supposed servant of God, congregants, religious leaders, missionaries, that demand value. That demand recognition. That demand from me or any other people or any other leader or responsible or whatever you want to name in the church, Demand value. You have to value me. You have to place a price on me. I have to be like a, a, a diamond. And it's very difficult to preach a word like this from the pulpit. Because in the end of the day, if you hear another sermon from another congregation, you, will, you won't hear nothing of this. You will hear that you do have value. And you will hear that you are worthy. And you will hear that you are special in God's eyes. And you are here, all those things that in the end of the day, they are part of the truth, but it's manipulated, manipulated in a way that empower you more than empower God himself. In a way that you increase more than and Jesus decreases. In a way that you will be more capable than God himself. When in the end of the day, we are not capable of nothing. And our capabilities and strength comes from God. For those that are in rehab, why you think you are so fresh and feeling so strong? You think that is just the food you eat. You are completely wrong. There is a spiritual environment. There is a spiritual strength that is working in your life. Even to those that are not, that still don't believe that much, the God is working in your life. For those that come and are visitors and, and are congregants that attend the church every Sunday and come and congregate with us, maybe you are gaining a strength that you might think it's from God. It's God that gives you that strength. So capacity, capability, strength, it comes from God, not from, our, from ourselves. He is the one that keeps us moving, keeps us going. We cannot do it by ourselves. So I'm done with this of... Sometimes I even feel myself, that's why I wrote according with my function in the body of, of, body of Christ, that I see people that they, they can't express like that, but you can, you can see that they're expecting me to give them a value and a recognition and an, appro an approval. That is an approval that comes from God. He approved us the moment he died in the cross of the Calvary. Wasn't that sufficient? What do you need more? Or what do we need more? It's, it's not that, it's sufficient that he died in the cross of the Calvary for you. He didn't despise anybody. He didn't say, oh no, this is a... This, he, he doesn't even say, okay, this is a Zulu. This is, this is a Klosa. No, okay, the Zulus, I died for them. The Klosas, I'm still thinking about it. Wait, let, let me just figure out how I'm going to do with this. No. For everybody. No distinction. He died for everybody, in behalf of everybody. A level of attention that only God can give you. Joshua 1 9, and we all know the scripture of Joshua 1 9. All of us we know. Have I not commanded you? 
Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He encourages, he commands, and he promises. He encourages Joshua, he commands Joshua, and then he, he promises to Joshua that wherever you go, I will be with you. Now, we like to take this for us. But let me tell you something. I'm so sorry to disappoint you. This word, this word was given to Joshua. I'm so sorry. He got this word from God. Not you and not I. Can I learn from, can I learn from it? Of course, I can learn from it. Because there is here what? There is here an encouragement. There is here, there is here a commission. Or a commandment. And there is then a promise. But this was given to Joshua. Wasn't given to me or to you or to us. This was given to Joshua. Can I leave this scripture? Of course we can leave. But was given to Joshua. He commanded you, not me. I wrote. He, Jesus, commanded you, not me. And I hope I'm speaking for the people that are always say that I was called by God. Jesus is calling me. I have a, God has a plan for my life. He has been changing my life. D -d 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 -d, all those things that we say. Sometimes they are so annoying. So annoying. Sometimes they can scratch my ears and my heart so much. They can tear my heart and they are so annoying to hear people saying that they are here because they love God and they want to serve God and they can do everything for God. And the first objection, first obstacle, they just quit and they just say that I'm no longer part of it. I didn't assign for this as we have a, a sort of assignment. There is no assignment with God. There is no contract with God. He loves us first than you ever could love him. Maybe you are sitting in his chair and you say that you love God and you don't love God. You just say it. You just say that you love, but maybe you don't love God. Because in order for me to love, I need to serve Him without conditions. It doesn't matter where I stay, where I live, what I eat. It doesn't matter who stays beside me. It doesn't matter who is in authority over me. I serve God. I love in love. It's service. I attend. I'm here to serve you, Lord. So I can I serve God? I cannot serve God. But God, I can serve the people that is beside me. Those I can serve. Those I can love. And many times we live and we go through Christian life and we are not capable of loving anybody. In other words, we are not capable of serving anybody because we have the schedule. We are not capable to be like that servant that is unstoppable. It doesn't stop. He goes beyond his limits and he's not waiting for any thankfulness. Jesus doesn't mention that, but that was the characteristic of those servants. They weren't waiting for any thankfulness because they were doing what they need to do. Finish and clap. They were doing what they need to do. They weren't expecting any clap in the back. All. And I see servants, they frustrate. They frustrate because they want a recognition that you, never, you will never have. I'm sorry. You won't get it. Unless you get for somebody that wants to empower you more and empower them, himself or herself more than the empowerment we must give to Jesus. Because that can always happen. So he commanded you and not me. Why are you looking for my approval? Or for me to tell you how good you are? And again, I, I, I wrote the same sentence in this part. Are we that good? Are we that special? Do we deserve such an honor? Or we are here to honor and glorify God's name and glorify God himself. Because this is what we say, this is what we sing, this is what we jump for. Because God, 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 so live it. Oh, today is Sunday, there is things that I can do. Oh, oh now it's five o'clock, I go home, there is things that I can do. Epa. There is ways, there is bridges that I can't no longer cross because... I also have my life. But you gave that life to Jesus. 
that you say that is yours now, suddenly. So the question of are we that good, I think that no, we are not good or that good. Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 says, Not that I have already obtained this or I am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ has made me his own. I did not obtain nothing. Epa, the Apostle Paul he could be the one saying, you know what, I obtain a lot. Pa. I opened church in Philippians, in Philippu. I opened a church in Ephesus. I opened a church in Galatia. I opened a church in Corinth. I opened a church in Rome. I opened a church in Jerusalem. I'm running the churches by letter and so on. I do deserve a sense of recognition. Me, the Apostle Paul, the greater of all, I planted so many churches. I must have a, a uh, at least a little recognition. I must, ach I, I achieve something. I think that I achieve. But here we see that maybe he's a lunatic. He's from another planet. Like I was saying to my wife in, when we were on the way here in the car. I, uh, and I was sharing with somebody too. I think I'm from another planet. I'm an alien because my ways and my thoughts are no longer uh, up to date. The way I think, the way I live, no, for many, is like, yeah, I'm a lunatic. But this one was a lunatic like me. So I'm happy. Because he was in jail. He was in jail. He did so many things. Yeah. According with the Christianity percep perception of many servants of God. Ooh, this guy did a lot. Oh, he must, uh, he deserves uh, recognition. But what he says, not that I have already obtained this. Or that I'm already, I'm already perfect. So... Was this guy all right, all right? Or was he aware? I think he was aware, you know why? Because it takes a born again Christian to look to the cross of the Calvary and say, you know what? I did not obtain nothing yet. And I'm not perfect. When you look to the cross, when you give a good look to the cross, not that I put a cross here with Jesus' whole hand, uh, uh, hanging there and so on that you say, no, I look, okay, oh, I look to the cross now I understand, no, 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 give a good look to the cross, God himself, in the cross dying for you for your sins, for your stories, for your drug abuse for your alcoholism, for your so many things that you did, so many things that nobody knows only you, only I we know only God knows because he knows, don't think that he doesn't so there is many things that we don't share with nobody and we think that we keep them hide. No, God knows them. He sees them. He knows what you did. We could, I, could, I can start a, a sermon, I know what you did last summer. There is a movie like that. Man. I know what you did last summer. But that sentence should, should, be, should, be, should be said by God himself. I know what you did last summer. Don't hide. I know. So he was, uh, uh, for me, he was aware Aware, and he says, "But I press on, make it my own, because Christ has made me His own." In other words, he want to, he want to make Christ His own. Christ must be mine. But see the awareness. He may, I was him, I was His before. He make, he make me Paul His own before. I didn't want it to be, but what the apostle is saying that. Before I became a Christian, before the foundations of times, I, was, I belong to Jesus already. And maybe this is your case of many. You were already before Jesus, before you were born or before the plan of Jesus established in your life. You were of his own already. He got you for him. He was, he was in, his, in his ways, he was entangling you to pull you to his plan and to his purpose. So now the Apostle Paul have an awareness. Okay, that, now that I know... That I, that I belong to Jesus way before. When I was still in my trespasses. When I was still persecuting Christians. I used to belong to Jesus. And I never knew about it. But in the right time he made me fell from the horse. And then I understood. Wait a minute. I am his belonging. I belong to him. So now that I know that I belong to him. I want him to belong to me. Does he belong to you? Or you are his possession? Because we, when, you, when we belong to each other, what does this mean? There is a commitment. 
You can, you, I, I can't say that I belong to Rita, Rita belongs to me, but one of us, we don't belong. There is no commitment. Or vice versa with the people that are married here in this congregation. So the same is, is this. Jesus, Jesus got Paul before Paul became Paul, when Paul was still Saul. And now so Paul says, you know what? Now I need, he needs to be mine. I am a way of being perfect or obtaining something on my own. I can't make it. This is awareness. This is understanding. Thank you. Don't strike. <laughs> I am a way of being perfect or of obtaining something on my own. And I wrote this is awareness, understanding, and the reality. Can I? Can we say it? Can we say it like the Apostle Paul? Can we stop being so self-centered? Life is not just about me, my brother and my sister. And it's not just about you. And sometimes we are so self-centered, like we are the only ones with problems. We are the only ones going across with trials and tribulations. We are the one. I've been telling people, you don't want to be in my shoes. How oh, are you okay, pastor? Do you feel okay? A few days ago, I went to the farm. One, one of the brothers came after me, oh, okay, do you feel okay? Okay, that's nice to hear, but I said, you know what, my brother? Was those days that I said, you know what, my brother? You don't want to be in my shoes. It might, it might look that my shoes, it's, it's nice to be in my shoes, but I think many, you wouldn't like to be in my shoes. You, you wouldn't like to sit in my bed when I wake up in the morning and when I have to start doing my stuff. And when my mind starts processing what I have to do, my responsibilities, and to sort out problems that I never created them. Never. The Lord. Can we do things for the Lord and for Him alone? Another question. And now I wrote in bold letters something that you, you could think from, the, from, from the, the, the seat where you are now. Oh, but pastor, you and others in authority over me also ask me stuff to do. So how can I unshoe this boot? I must do the things for the Lord, but you as, as pastor, in Rimar, you also ask me things to do. And there is people in the houses of Rimar that ask you stuff to do. So, and in your workplace, you have somebody, can be a man or a woman, that is a, your boss, the person that pays you for you to put food on the table, and that person is in authority over you, some way, somehow. So, now I no longer pay attention to what they say because I must do the things for the Lord and the Lord himself. So I wrote, so I finalized this sermon, sermon with Romans 13, verse 1 and 2. This Romans 13, it's incredible, is a, a, a portion of the Bible that you don't need a huge theological understanding. You don't need to go to a book even though that they do these things, but I think that, that it's too much. It's just to make the people to buy Bibles sometimes. It became a business. So I make a study Bible, and even the verses that need no understanding, I will put an extra understanding, not just to confuse you, but to sell Bibles also. Because some things in the Bible, they don't need too much interpretation. It is written, it is said, you just read and you understand. So what is written in Romans 13 verse 1 and 2? Let every person be subject to governing authorities. Very simple. Do we need the theological uh, book aside to understand this? I think not. Let every person be subjected to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. Finish. Very, uh, uh, the, the Apostle Paul, he, puts, he put a calm here. Eh? He put a calm and then, no, actually put a dot. Uh, sorry, no, he put a comb. He put a comb to continue. But I think that he should put a dot for a higher understanding, for the sentence to be plain and bold. But because he was inspired by the Spirit of God, let's keep the comb there because the comb is there for a reason. Okay? So it's to continue the text. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Every person that is in authority... Every person in your life that are placed as authority of your life was placed by God. I always like to give the same example in, as a testimony of my life. 
I got an authority in Rimar, Spain, in an area, in a house, big, a big house, like, that is a proper hyper but big, massive building. 